Thank you very much. First of all, thank you to Alva and Marc Lebeau um, to having started all of this and then to Sebastiano and Tara to actually organizing that and inviting me to give this lecture. So I'm going to talk about the landscape and ritual in early Bronze Age Jordan. And I'm going to start with a bit of background to the late Calcolithic and the early Bronze Age. And we'll then move to general thoughts about ritual and landscape and how these two might be connected with each other. And then talk about the early Bronze Age side of Murerat and why ritual and landscape might play an interesting role there. So first of all, I would like to make a few statements about the uh, um, chronology, just to give everybody an idea where we are. Starting with the late Calcolithic, and I'll put a table up here, which kind of gives a rough idea how um, that relates to Mesopotamian and Egyptian chronology. So the late Calcolithic, roughly 4,500 to 3,900, 3,800. Then there might be a shortish transitional period, and then it's the early Bronze Age one, A and B, which starts around 3,600. And that is roughly, most of the early Bronze Age is roughly equivalent to the Uruk period and the Nakeda period, period in Egypt. So let me start with saying a few basic things about the late Calcolithic. It is an area where we have strong regionalism with rather different levels of socio-political development. Possibly the areas where the organization is most complex is the Negev and the Jordan Valley. But that might well be an outcome of the research history, which gives us particularly many sites studied in these two areas. We know much less about, for example, the Jordanian highlands or the coastal area. But we do know that there is quite a regional difference in the Calcolithic period. This is shown by different architecture from the different regions. It's shown by different cultic objects, which you can see here illustrated on the figure where you can see that you have, for example, these uh, basalt stands only in the north. You have ivory items mostly in the Negev and only the kind of hollow pottery figurines appear over larger areas. And we also have a very localized metal production. So different areas develop quite different during the late Calcolithic. We also have very different and varied burial practices. There are open air cemeteries, there are artificial and natural caves. There's one charnel house, and there are, of course, intracite burials. Now, many people are buried in ossuaries, which you can see here at two um, pictures, which show a very typical characteristic of these ossuaries and that is their anthropomorphic features. Most uh, burials are secondary burials. The later Calcolithic ritual and cultic life is also quite rich and cultic and ritual activities seem to have played quite a large role. There are cultic buildings in, for example, Tulela Trasul, in Ein Gedi, in Gilat, which might have even had a regionally importance, and there is the altar in Shikmim. There are probably 
domestic cultic activities, so activities outside the temple, like in Rasul, where several normal houses have the wall paintings, the famous wall paintings. We have quite a lot of cultic objects. We already mentioned basalt stands and hollow clay animals and ivory figurines and violin shaped objects, which actually come from all over the country. There might also have been prestige objects, which existed mostly made from copper. And we can be sure that feasting played a large role in the organization of life in the late Calcolithic, possibly particularly drinking, as the amount of smallish drinking vessels in that period is remarkably high compared with other periods before and after. We have a specialized pottery production in the late Calcolithic, private storage. Most sites are quite small and only a few sites are larger, like Pella or Shikmim, and particularly Telela Trasul. And these larger sites show um, that they're internally differentiated with clearly domestic areas, cultic areas, and also craft areas. And most of these sites are situated at the lower end of wadis. Concerning metal, we can also see specialized production in the late Calcolithic. There are many prestige and cultic objects and very few tools. The prestige objects are just one to very briefly remind everybody of the wonderful copper finds from the Han as they are shown here, um, the mace heads, standards, and of course, cylinders and some other special objects from there. The metal production and distribution in the late Calcolithic is again, very localized. Our local copper sources all come from the south, from Finan, and Timna and possibly from some sites in the Araba. The imported copper, which is also used in that period, comes from outside. Caucasus might be one of the regions where it comes from. The production remains for the Calcolithic copper production all come from the sites on this map with a square. So they're all in the Negev while remains, copper remains, come from all over the area. All the reddish sites have copper remains. So we have a much wider distribution of finds than of production. So we have many prestige items like the ones I just showed you from the home and very few so-called everyday items, things like axes, axes, wire, etc. Most of the material is made from imported copper alloy and only few items are made from the local copper. And very different levels of labor have been invested in these copper items. They're made from different raw material and they follow different production methods. And I would think that all these copper items are part of the socio-political and or ritual life in the late Calcolithic, they played a large role in allowing the society to structure itself. And I think one can make a kind of very generalized pyramid with the few cylinders at the top, the more standards in the middle and the very many mace heads, there are over 300 of those at the bottom. And I think these might be different levels of prestige goods with different importance for cultic and ritual purposes. And the so-called tools might have been very low level prestige items. They were most likely not used as tools as they have been produced and treated, which does not make them very apt to be used as tools, even so they look like them. So to summarize the late Calcolithic, 
it's a very rich cultic and ritual repertoire of finds. They're very varied regional expressions. They're clearly marked areas for cultic buildings and possibly even cultic sites, like in the case of Gilat. There are a few large sites, but mostly very small sites. They're specialized production for copper and some pottery, but much is still household production. And there might have been prestige items, but there are no obvious status differences between people. So if we then move to the transitional period, um, which is still very difficult to grasp, and I'm not even sure that it is a period which is relevant for the entire Southern Levant. But we have a number of new sites, for example, Wadi Fidan 4, which is in Wadi Fanan, so close to one of the uh, raw materials to the copper sources. And we have Hujerat al Guslan and Magas, both close to Aqaba, and probably the site of Afrida. Some of these were specialized sites. That's certainly true for Hujerat al Guslan being a copper producing site. But we see changes in the metal production compared to what we saw in the late Calcolithic. It's a small scale production close to the raw material sources in the case of Wadi Fidan 4. And it's a larger scale production for the sites close to Aqaba. It also shows that now not only the copper ore from Fennan is used, but also those from Timna. We have much more production of tools, which now seem to be used as tools, and of ingots for export. And generally, it's much more local material and much less imported material. So there's a clear change in every aspect which has to do with metal production at the end of the late Calcolithic period into the transitional period and certainly into the early Bronze Age. Nevertheless, there might be a chronological overlap in certain parts of the Southern Levant. In the later early Bronze Age, so after early Bronze Age one, um, there are copper alloys, but still a lot of local material is used we have large production sites close to the raw material sources. Um, it gets far more specialized, the smelting and the melting is separated. Sinai mines are being used, far more functional objects are produced. Um, there are very few prestige objects and these are not necessarily made from imported ore. And we have a lot of household production, but also large scale production like in Herbert Hamra, if done. And if you look at the distribution, you remember in the late Calcolithic, all known production remains came from the Negev. Now, all the sites with a red star on the map from Hermann Gens from 2000 are sites which show copper working remains from the early Bronze Age one. So you can see that it is far more distributed through the entire Southern Levant. On the right hand side is a map from Ben Yosef um, 2016, which is just dealing with a part south of the Dead Sea. And again, it is showing a much wider production of metal production. So in the early Bronze Age itself, um, there's a restart and a change after the end of the late Calcolithic. There's clear differences in the material culture in the north and south. There are new burial customs. We have now large cemeteries with secondary burials with very visible markers. And the dolmens are a special form of these um, new burial customs. We have a lot of new settlements and some continuation, and generally the settlements show a greater interest in arable land. We still have very small sites, 
with some exceptions and the sites grow during the early Bronze Age, particularly into the early Bronze Age two and three. We see in the early Bronze Age one very weak hierarchical structures. We have no rich graves or rich houses. There is very little evidence for any prestige items. And this has been interpreted as a heterarchical society, which might be organized in houses. As I said, that is true for the early Bronze Age one. Things do change during the urbanization in the early Bronze Age two and three. And we have cultic buildings in most cities from the later early Bronze Age periods, but some possibly even in early Bronze Age one, for example, in Megiddo and Mutawak and possibly in Mugerat. So I want to talk a little bit about ritual and cult in research history. Until the 1970s, all of you archeologists know everything we did not understand was either magical or cultic or ritual. And it was from the 1970s on, so very much with the onset of the processional archeology span that everything magical was left out and explanations were always meant to be reasonable. So a lot of phenomenon were explained only science-based and the kind of overbuilt was very much left out of explanations. Now there is a certain change back and a certain recognition that logic and magic are not always exclusive and cult and ritual have made a certain comeback in explanations, but in a very different form, meaning we're not trying to explain what we do not understand by magic and cult, but we're trying to come up with explanations for why we think something is magical, cultic, or ritual. I'm trying to give you a very general definition of ritual. It's a patent activity or practice which is oriented towards the control or organization of human affairs, primarily symbolic in character and as a rule socially constructed. This is a definition which owes a lot to Firth, Renfew, Verhoeven and all of them going back generally to Bell. Ritual is also a form of human action that often leaves material traces. There are different types of rituals. Rituals can be sacred and profane and a mix of both. And rituals tend to be formal, very often traditional, repetitive, symbolic, rule regulated, staged and performed and requires paraphernalia. And I will come back to these attributes later. And also I've just given a very general definition. I do think that you need um, the opposite of what I've written here. So you actually, no, you don't need cross-cultural definitions. You need specific definitions for each case. So when you look at rituals, you need to define and describe the ritual in its own rights. Rituals in general tend to be performances to deal with conflicts and other crises. Rituals are also practice. So ritualization produces an agent who's doing the ritual and the agent reproduces a structure in which the ritual is happening which then reproduces the agent. So we're talking about a circle between society and agent. And the ritual is also fundamental for communication and organization in non-hierarchical societies. To put it bluntly, if nobody is there who tells everybody else what to do, you need rituals in order to come together and organize life. There are certain um, types of rituals, they're the read the passage rituals, for example, 
birth, baptism, or such rite passage rituals. There are calendrical rituals. There are rites of feasting, fasting, and festivals. A potlatch, as shown here, is one. Carnival is another. And there are political rituals without which nobody can become the president of the United States. And it's particularly the Rite de Passage, as Van Gennep and also partly Perna have defined them, which I'm interested in. So important changes in life, like birth, death, and other changes, which are always cultural specific. And these Rite de Passage always consist out of three steps, the beginnings, where a separation happens, the middle, where the state of liminality is arrived at. And these are often the very important ones because um, they're a dangerous phase. And then the ends, which are usually reads of um, reintegration. So if we look at that in terms of deaths, as we're concerned with burials, the death of a person would be the beginning, then a person is dead, not finally buried. That causes problems for a group which needs to be solved. There's grief, there's disturbances of social fabric, there's a danger of a person which is neither here nor there, and the final burial ends that. So after having treated Ritual, I now want to say a few things about landscape and how one looks at that. And I'm looking here in a long-term view, how cultural and natural landscapes interact. Landscapes are palimpsests, uh, where memory is on top of memory of memory, like this last standing wall of a monastery in Southwest Germany, surrounded only by fields. And landscape is environment. So it also has economical aspects. Landscape is a system. It connects off-site and settlement-based activities. Landscape is also power. It can be ideologically manipulated. As everybody knows, whoever looked at the way castles are always set on hilltops. And landscape is, of course, experience. So it is imbued with meaning for people. And it has a lot to do with how we um, perceive a landscape. So landscapes and monuments are connected. And a lot of what I'm saying here um, is inspired very much by Chris Harris' research on the monuments in Brittany. There's a long history and a wide spatial distribution of a veneration of natural landscapes. So hilltops are particular water features, for example, waterfalls. And landscape features have often attracted popular names. There must be a dozen Lord Wives, which are around the Dead Sea, for example and they're all referred to stones. Folklore often connects standing stones, for example, with humans or with deities. There is Meg and her daughters um, for a famous collection of standing stones. And there are lots of other uh, names given to those. Seven Knights. Certain landscape features have been and are still considered alive. For example, sea volcanoes in Hawaii definitely have um, human characteristics and they can get angry. The changing of natural landscapes into a built environment shows the importance of action, of agency of the human. So humans do not react to landscapes passively, they actually take a part in shaping those landscapes. Nevertheless, it's very difficult to get an idea of the past meaning of a landscape as a relationship between particular viewers and the things they view is cultural specific and landscapes change. 
just to give a few examples of what I mean by this, we all know talking trees, possibly tree beard from the Hobbit films is the most famous one. Um, the Singende Klingende Bäumchen is a German fairy tale. So trees definitely take on personalities. And if you just go to the internet and check for meaningful stones, you get to lots of home pages which tell you about the meaning and benefits of particular stones. So this tradition of stones and trees having an effect on human beings is still very valid. And the monumentality and the connection of monuments and landscape is of course very obvious in Brittany, um, in the Karnak alignments, but also in the enormous men here, which is known from Loch Mariquer. And what I want to talk about, the monuments I'm talking about are not quite of that size, but they certainly shape a landscape too. Another example how stones are still meaningful is the way people today still relate to stones. There's a so-called Merlin's Grave in Brockelland in Brittany, which is very richly decorated. Well, you can possibly just see the flowers lying at the foot of the men here in Karnak. In Avebury, I think that character definitely tried to get some um, positive powers from the stones in Avebury. And the Lanyon Coit um, dolmen in Cornwall um, is here because it shows a very particular spot to put such a monument. You can have a very wide view to the ocean on all sides from that monument. So landscape, monuments and ritual form a very interesting possibility to explain certain phenomenon. And the ritual perspective on landscapes focuses on the way people view the environment as symbolic expressions of basic values and cosmological ideas. That goes back to an idea of Roland Barthes and a quote from Harland and Harland, the environment people dwell in does not only offer affordances for practical use, it may also offer affordances for the construction of meaning. Furthermore, people may seek to enhance the importance of such symbolic meanings by expressing them in humanly built constructions, for example, megalithic constructions. And orientation of these constructions might be very meaningful. An example of that was shown to me by Stephen Rosen, who took me to his site of Ramad Saharonim, uh, which is a late Neolithic, early Calcolithic structure in the Negev, where solstices play a role, where the structure has clearly been built with a view to a certain direction. So having said all of that to explain why I consider landscape, ritual and monuments being connected with each other, I will now turn to the ritual landscape of Murerat, which is southwest of Madaba. Um, most structures and dolmens at the site are from the early Bronze Age one. Um, a few remains mostly finds, not structures, date back to the PPNB and go all the way into the Islamic periods. We have a large dolmen field there. We have many structures made from standing stones on the central knoll and in excavation trenches. And possibly the most famous of these standing stones is the Hajar al-Mansu, which you can see here with two of my students, which worked with me in Murerat for several years. There are other dolmen fields in the vicinity, as you can see here on the map by uh, Jamie Fraser. Murerat is the southernmost of the dolmen sites, and the ones from Mount Nebo, Jadida, are the next ones, and followed by the ones in Adaima 
goes to, to Leila Trasur. Um, Murray Rat has certainly suffered from modern disturbances and modern interests, may, mostly in the form of stone quarries. So this is the setting of Murray Rat, the ugly white scar in the landscape is one of the stone quarries, which is directly around um, Murerat. The arrows point to the um, different areas where dormants have been found. The back arrow is area four, where most of the dormants are situated. Um, in area five, three, and seven, they are less, but some of the most spectacular dormants um, area eight in the background, we still need to work at, and area six, which is in the foreground and outside the picture, also still needs to be looked at. And this is the central knoll, which, as you can see, sits between the amphitheater of the dormant fields. And as a flat picture, you can see the different areas. Area one is the central knoll. And the dormants I'm going to show you come from area seven and area three on relatively flat ground and area four up on the hill. The stone quarries you see here, the north quarry and the south quarry have now stopped growing towards Mugerat as the department has actually bought the dolmen hills so that the destruction on these hills cannot continue. So this is area four, and you can see it is a quite impressive looking landscape, but you do need a moment before you can actually see the dolmens. Only when you come closer, you see them more clearly in the landscape, and you can see that the natural material lying around and the dolmens actually have a great similarity. The dolmens are built along the natural terraces of these small hills. So the red arrows show you one of the terraces along area four. And here you can see actually three dolmens um, behind each other standing on the same terrace in area Four. And all the dolmens have large stone sides, which can be very heavy, um, particularly the large capstones might well be over 10 tons. The end stones are usually smaller. Several of the capstones, like the one in the lower picture, are roof shaped. And the floor stones are not always visible. And in many cases, there are actually no floor stones. The dormants are built on bedrock. They seem to have been surrounded in some cases by tumulus, as um, this dormant 4123 um, shows both in the drawing and on the photo. These might be the remains of a tumulus which was originally built by the dormen. One of the disadvantages that so many dormens are built on the steep hillsides is that they got um, destructed most likely naturally. Just imagine an earthquake would shake these very badly and a second earthquake even more. And of course, Jordan is a country of earthquakes. The dolmens seem to have, not in every case, but in a number of cases, been erected on platforms, which can either be natural platforms on the hillside or this air dolmen 7008, which is on a flatter ground, seems to have been built on a carefully built platform. Um, the left photo shows it before excavation, the right hand side one shows you the platform um, in the excavation. We are planning to excavate that dolmen also on the inside, but I already mentioned the weights that requires a bit of um, heavy equipment. 
the quarries for the dolmen seem to have been always very close by. Here you can see a kind of dolmen side stone shaped hall in the hillside. And we see that quite often in the direct vicinity of the dolmens where the quarries. And this is just showing you the different natural terraces in area four. And you can see that the dolmens are built along these terraces. And the opening is often towards the southeast or towards the central knoll, which is more south. But the opening seems to have more to do with the way the dolmens are built on the terrace and not with any um, sun, moon, or um, spring related um, ideas. Nearly all of the dolmens are visible from the central knoll. You can see that here, this is the central knoll and all dolmens are visible except very few on the northern side of area four. All others and one which is very low in area seven. All other dolmens are visible from the highest point in the central knoll. So the dolmens are made from stones in the direct vicinity. That means um, active reshaping of the landscape has happened. From the natural phenomenon, stones breaking visibly to the actual built environment, the dolmens. The dolmens are connected to the central knoll through visibility, and the central knoll is covered with standing stone structures. So stones have been used to build the dolmens along the hills, and the central knoll has many standing stone structures there. The dolmens might also have been reused during the Middle Bronze Age. So the landscape is certainly a palimpsest being reused. So this is the central knoll. Please note that north is now at the lower end. Um, one of the photos taken by Bob Pewley and David Kennedy showing that very nicely. This is the uh, Wadi Murerat, and that is the road which is actually going down to Wadi Zerka Ma'in. And here you see the foot of area four, one of the hills with dormants. This is the central knoll looked at from the um, area with the dormants. Um, the highest point, which not surprisingly the surveyor has chosen as a surveying point, is also the point from which you can see most of the dolmens. I would like to point out these two stones in the center of the picture, which is what we call the Western Gate, and that is Condor's stone, because Condor is actually mentioning it in his publication after his visit to Murerat. This is a map. Um, and I will show you an aerial photo from that area. What you can see on the map is a number of horseshoe shaped features. That's horseshoe shape three, horseshoe shape four, beginning here. Um, rectangular features, rectangular one, rectangular two, and rectangular three. And down here is horse shape one. So this is an aerial feature showing you horse shoe shape one. And a number of other structures all made from large stones, which have not always easy to interpret shapes. And we have trench number one here, which I will discuss in a second. The standing stone structures, as I said, come in the shape of horseshoes or rectangles. And what you can see here is a rectangle two and rectangle one, and the much larger horseshoe one, of which you just saw a corner in the picture before. Um, that is a um, five meter scale. 
and that stone is one meter 30 to give you an idea. Now, very kindly, Anna Weiser had actually tried to make out of our not very sufficient pictures, um, a 3D model of the rectangular one, which you can see here, just possibly giving you a slightly better idea how it looked. Now, the so-called Western Gate, I'm not insisting that this is a gate, but it helps if you name certain features to find your way through all these standing stones. So the Western Gate consists out of two large standing stones um, in a line of slightly smaller stones forming um, a long wall kind of feature. And we excavated there um, on the site, which is towards the top of the central knoll, it was quite clear that these huge standing stones stand on nothing, just on soil. There was no construction there, which was one of the reasons we wanted to find out. On the other side, which goes towards the lower end of the central knoll, we found a packing, which looks nearly like a pathway towards that area and you can just see three stones in front of the large standing stone most likely to keep it in place and then afterwards it was all a drop and the other trenches in which we found standing stones is the trenches three and four at the northern end um, you see here early Bronze Age walls are uh, marked with red for 1422 and orange. And the um, green named walls are from later periods. And in there is a line of standing stones. They are just not standing anymore. So here is a picture from a later stage of the excavation, and this is a long line of standing and fallen over quite large stones. That one here is one meter 30 high, that one roughly the same. The interesting thing was these stones were partly polished, which was not us always holding on to the stone. That was obviously polished either purposefully or through use already at the time. And again, showing you here, these would be the line of standing stones. So we have the same kind of standing stones. This is the same line again. We have the same lines of standing stones in the trenches we excavated as we have on top of the central knoll still clearly visible. And next to these standing stones was this kind of U-shaped wall, which we hoped would turn into a kind of obsidial room, but it didn't. It turned into a room which had another wall not parallel to it and not in any way touching. Nevertheless, they have the same kind of floor in between those two walls. And we found quite interesting pottery on this floor, which I will come back to in a second. And another trench, which we only started in 2019, shows us another monumental structure. This trench is 10 by 10 meters, which means that this building you can see here uh, of which we only started in the western half, is around 20 meters long, possibly seven meters wide, but it might well continue southwards. So it's a monumental building, again made partly from two-faced walls, but also from large standing stones. So that would be very interesting to study in more detail. Coming back to the pottery we found. On the floor, we found some pottery in situ, all smashed. And when put together, um, we came up with two 
very large vessels, very unusual vessels with double handles, sets of double handles and single latch handles in between, for which I have found so far no comparisons. These vessels would have contained 25 to 27 liters, so there would have been very large sink of two normal household buckets. Each of those is usually 10 to 15 liters. So quite considerable amount you could have had in there. They were conserved in the ACOR lab, for which I'm very thankful. So we have an unusual repertoire in this trench three and four in the funny U-shaped room next to the line of standing stones. The Mureirat balls with numerous handles seem to be unique. They are certainly too large and too heavy to be carried by one person. So one immediately thinks of the necessity that this might have been carried by more than one person. It's combined with some other unusual pottery. There's a teapot which is heavily decorated, which is a rare form and certainly an earlier tradition. So the pottery we found in there is unique or very rare and is special by its decoration or size. So these are typical elements of feasting paraphernalia possibly used in a ritual. So the um, interpretation of that pottery, I would follow there um, what Twist says about feasting. Feasting tends to be presented as a communal activity that involves food preparation and consumption on a larger scale than is habitually the case. This conceptualization allows us to identify it on the basis of large scale cooking or serving equipment all out collection of food remains. We would here deal with serving equipment. So Murerat boards indicate large scale consumption, possibly connected to a performance, slow walk, coordinated movement. Think of carrying large vessels, like for example, in a men's half. Two people need to do that. They need to coordinate how they walk. These containers played an important role in the presentation and consumption of food, and that would have helped in identity creation. And that would most likely have been consumption in the context of ritual feasting. So if you bring landscape and ritual together, moments are a natural setting for ritual activities like shamanistic performances. They have a small inside, they're dark, but they form an inside. The natural environment is vertical with the hills and so are the monuments. So it's a metaphoric construction of the ritual landscape. Natural and built environments are loaded with ritual meaning, probably expressing where people belong in a social hierarchy, for example, groups. In some dormant fields, it is clear that the dormants are organized in groups. We're not yet reached that um, stage in our analysis to say anything about that. The prominence of the dormants in the natural environment where they stand out as landmarks might mean that they have also served as material reminders of memories legitimating claims to land and positions. So there might have more than one function. They might have been used in rituals, but there might, of course, also make a very clear point of here we are and we've always been here. Rituals are formal, mostly traditional, repetitive in every dormen again, symbolic, rule regulated, staged and performed sink of performance with those large vessels, um, possibly uphill to dormants, and they require paraphernalia for which these uh, vessels would count. So the dormants are large contain containers, some monumental buildings which might have been open 
they all could have been used in rituals. The dolmens con could work as traditional and symbolic aspects, everlasting, they're certainly still lasting today. The situation invites formal and performative behavior. Food is intrinsically social and is used in construction and negotiating social relations. It assists or could have assisted the read the passage rituals for renegotiating social relations after death. Feast and societies which have no clear hierarchical or political organizations, so heterarchic societies, play an essential role in organizing society as they allow a forum for acting out social roles. So if we assume that burials play a large role in people's lives and that dolmens would have been a place <clears throat> where people would be buried finally, then Murerat could have been an area where these read the passages connected with feasts in order to reestablish the completeness of the society might have played a large role. Murerat is therefore most likely a special site with its burial places and cultic structures. Rituals connected to death, which are often intertwined with food, were a major event in life. Feasting with food for many people played a role in ritual context, and the dolmens and the cultic buildings form the background for that. So feasting would be for cohesion, and the dolmen fields might be for different groups of people. So feasts would have brought these different groups together, a very important aspect for these societies. But feasting, of course, can always also have an element of competition, size does play a role between groups, towns, and regions, which might have been coming together there for ritual occasions. The longevity of cultural, the cultural longevity of ritual was made very clear to us in, I think, 2018, where one morning we came and found all of these little constructions put on different stones on Murerat. It was very nicely done. And it is very interesting that the people who live around Murerat, there is no direct settlement. Um, there are a number of Bedouins which keep coming back to the site, that they have a very close relationship. And we have from those people, so not from industrial activity, but from the people living around there, very little destructive behavior. They obviously feel quite close to the site, which is expressed in little gifts like those. So thank you for your attention. And I would also like to thank the workmen, without whom all that dealing with very heavy stones wouldn't have been possible. My students, Abu Ibrahim, who is our guard and provides much needed tea, Copenhagen University in the Department of Antiquities, um, two funding bodies, the Palestine Research Fund and the Danish Institute in Damascus. And thanks has to go particularly to Hugh Barnes for the maps, Matthias Flender, who has been responsible for the survey, and Anderson for the ceramics, Isabel Rubin for the excavation, and all the supervisors. So thank you all very much.